Good morning. I'm Father Ollie Williams. I teach in the business school, Catholic Social Teaching in Business, Business Ethics, Corporate Governance. And uh, it's my pleasure to spend some time with you this morning talking about uh, baptismal witness in the world of commerce. Just briefly, uh, what I'm going to do is, first of all, talk about the lay apostolate in Vatican II. I think probably many of you know more than I do about that, but just give you the uh, overarching view of the role of the layman in business from the point of view of the church. Then uh, some discussion of the purpose of business, which I think the key issue is the purpose of business. And then the UN Global Compact, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about that uh, because I think uh, that's one of the best ways to get a critical mass of business uh, into these issues of, of trying to uh, widen uh, our understanding of the purpose of business. And I'm on the board of directors of the UN Global Compact Foundation. As you may know, the UN Global Compact is uh, 8,000 companies in 145 countries who are trying to advance human rights, particularly in developing countries. Uh, it's very much uh, following the uh, Catholic social teaching vision, not explicitly religious, needless to say, in the United Nations. But I've kind of hitched my star to advancing that cause. And in fact, um, we're celebrating the 15th anniversary of the UN Global Compact, which starts this morning at the UN in New York City. Uh, I will fly out this afternoon. I had agreed to do this talk <laughs> over a year ago before they set the date. So you won't see me, unfortunately, the rest of the week since we have a 1,000 CEOs coming in from uh, 100 countries uh, and they're meeting in the General Assembly quarters in the United Nations to talk about uh, some of these issues. And I'll talk briefly how I think that influences what we're trying to do uh, in Catholic social teaching and business. And then uh, I'm gonna talk about the vocation of the business leader. This is a document that came out two years ago from the Pontifical Council of Justice and Peace under Cardinal Turkson's direction. It really uh, follows from Pope Francis' direction to uh, Cardinal Turkson to get something business leaders can understand. We need something user-friendly. Uh, and I hope uh, to maybe encourage some of you to use it in your ministry. It's a wonderful document. It really is user-friendly. Uh, I remember when I first started this uh, ministry uh, teaching some 25 years ago, we interviewed a lot of CEOs, many of them Notre Dame graduates, and said, what kind of help are you getting from your pastors from Notre Dame on trying to bring Catholic social teaching into business? And we generally got uh, an answer that said, they're treating us in two ways, either as robber barons with open hostility or as rich benefactors with undue deference. <laughs> and you can guess which one at Notre Dame we use. Uh, but the fact is uh, we've tried to develop ministry uh, and to really help people who are in what I call a noble vocation. I think a business uh, leader today is, is a tremendously important uh, vocation. Uh, then a little bit about the ministry of preaching and, and uh, uh, the foundations of uh, some of our uh, conceptual thought on this area. Uh, often when I begin this discussion, I tell a little story which helps you understand that uh, this, is a, uh, this is tough business to try to integrate religious and ethical values with business values. Uh, and I think you can just follow the response to uh, the Pope's recent encyclical on the environment to see that it really does raise a lot of complicated issues and, and sometimes polarizes uh, people. But uh, the story goes uh, that was a very good ethical businessman who lived a good and noble ethical life and he died and met St. Peter at the gates and Peter said, Mr. Businessman, you have lived a very good and noble life and we have a high place for you in heaven. Well, the man was delighted and Peter said, unfortunately, there's no room here right now, but you as a concession can, can come back to earth in any role you would like. Just tell us what you'd like to do. 
Well, this man had been a businessman in the United States, and he had seen so many of his colleagues grow very wealthy uh, selling foreign cars. So he said, Peter, I want to be a foreign car dealer in a major city. In a short time, Peter came back and he said, have we got the assignment for you? He said, what am I? He said, you are the first Chrysler dealer in Tokyo. <laughs> and I think what that story does is, is tell you often you have to rethink and repackage the conceptual approach you're taking uh, to serious business problems. Uh, and it's not uh, often uh, going to turn out the way you think. Um, anyway, let's um, uh, take a look at uh, the, the key, I think, uh, uh, marching order for the Vatican II and the role of business leader comes from the decree on the uh, uh, laity. Uh, and the point um, that, of course, I'm quoting paragraph five here, uh, and the point being that the role of the layperson is to bring uh, Christian values and Christ's love into uh, their particular uh, work. Uh, as it's Christ's redemptive work, while of itself directed toward the salvation of men, involves also the renewal of the whole temporal order. Hence, the mission of the church is not only to bring to men the message and grace of Christ, but also to penetrate and perfect the temporal sphere with the spirit of the gospel. In fulfilling this mission of the church, the laity therefore exercise their apostolate both in the church and in the world, in both the spiritual and the temporal orders. These realms, although distinct, are so connected in the one plan of God that he himself intends in Christ to appropriate the whole universe into a new creation, initially here on earth, fully on the last day. In both orders, the layman, in being a believer and a citizen, should be constantly led by the same Christian conscience. And so um, this has been echoed through in many encyclicals. Uh, and I think uh, business people and, uh, have been called co-creators, uh, going from the te text in Genesis, uh, which in fact uh, Pope Francis just quoted again, uh, in the recent encyclical, but pointing out that God has created the world, but he has given us uh, minds and hearts to continue that creation. And we can be co-creators, and particularly in the business world, people are called to use their intelligence to make the world more humane. Uh, and uh, maybe we have overdone the use of the environment. That's certainly what uh, Pope Francis is asking us to think about. Uh, but the fact is we are co-creators, and that's, uh, in fact, part of the uh, uh, mission of the church to stress that. Now, it seems to me, if you look at, uh, you know, you can hardly go by a day without seeing some failure of business. And I read the Wall Street Journal every day, which, of course, is, is not uh, your most liberal journal, but it talks about the scandals and the failures of business, quite honestly. And whether it's Enron or WorldCom or the financial crisis, there's been an awful lot that's uh, been untoward uh, uh, in the business world, and it's hurt a lot of people. Uh, and in my reflections, uh, and down through the history of church encyclicals, the key point that I think that's been misunderstood is what is the purpose of business? You know, uh, next time you're at a cocktail party, ask somebody, what's the purpose of business? To make money. That's never been the church's teaching. And you might be surprised to find out, in the best secular thought, that's not accepted anymore. The purpose of business is not simply to make money. Uh, in the UN Global Compact, as I say, we've got 8,000 companies, and it's all the big ones, all the household words names in this country are part of the UN Global Compact. We've come up with the idea, and the church had it 100 years ago, that the purpose of business is to create sustainable value for stakeholders. The purpose of business is not simply to make money, it's to create sustainable value for stakeholders. Now, one of the stakeholders is the investor. You better make some money for the investor or you're not going to be here tomorrow. 
as I tell my students, never let it be said that a professor at Notre Dame told you you didn't have to make money. In fact, we want some of it when you make it big time. And you can see we've been pretty successful. <laughs> uh, but uh, the purpose of business is to create sustainable value for stakeholders. Now, who are your stakeholders? Well, obviously your employees, create sustainable value for them means giving them a living wage, giving them educational possibilities so they're mobile and think, in fact, if so if your business isn't doing so well, uh, giving some job security right? and listening to them. What do they say sustainable value means for them? Another key stakeholder obviously is your customers. Without creating products and services that your customers want, you're not here. Uh, and so that's what we teach our uh, students to create sustainable value uh, for customers. Uh, communities where you have your operations. The physical environment, which is what Pope Francis just recently addressed. Uh, so the, uh, the list of stakeholders I put there, the poor. And uh, obviously, uh, as you can see from my, my slides, uh, I'm trying to remind us of the poor <laughs> uh, by some pictures of people who are struggling and, and the fact that in creating work and jobs for the poor is probably the best way uh, to help them uh, join the, the good life. Um, so um, the, uh, the document that I suggested we look at called the vocation of the business leader, incidentally you can Google this and get it online uh, for free. It's called Vocation of the Business Leader, a Reflection, uh, and it's introduced by Cardinal Turkson, who is the president of the Pontifical Council of Justice and Peace. As you may know, Cardinal Turkson was the former Archbishop of Ghana. Uh, he did his doctoral studies uh, in Rome, but he also studied in the United States for a number of years in New York. Uh, so he's very familiar. He's been our guest here several times and uh, has become a, a friend of mine. That's how I got involved in, in helping with this document. But in their terms, what do they say the purpose of business is? Uh, to summarize many pages in here, they say it's threefold. To produce good works, or good goods, produce good work, and produce good wealth. And that's just a summary of, uh, and, and they go through and elaborate uh, using uh, many references to scripture. <coughs> and the point, of course, uh, in the first one to produce good goods is business should try to produce goods and services that in fact really enable people to be all they're called to be. Uh, and uh, obviously there are many good examples of, of good goods. You know, you and I, because of the pharmaceutical industry, probably going to live a little, little longer than our grandparents or great grandparents. Uh, we also, because of technology, can enjoy good music. Uh, I live in a student dorm, and uh, fortunately the walls are very well insulated. I tell the students they did this so you don't have to listen to my classical music. And of course I don't have to listen to whatever it is that you're <laughs> doing. Uh, but the fact is we all enjoy higher quality of life uh, because of the uh, innovation and creativity of people in uh, of business. Uh, so, uh, and so the document encouraged the, to uh, gen, uh, address genuine human needs uh, uh, through development and production of goods and services. Good work, the document reminds uh, people, and it's interesting, I mean, there probably is nothing in this document that hasn't been said in the encyclicals. But I think Pope Francis' genius, as already been said last night, is he wants people to hear it. <laughs> he wants he wants user-friendly language. And uh, his encyclical on the environment, which I just read very quickly, I haven't mastered it by any means, is very user-friendly language. And I looked up, why is it? Because, you know, I use Sentation Miss Annis, which is another wonderful encyclical. Most business leaders say, what's he saying? You know, this is not user-friendly. Uh, and if any of you use some of these documents, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, Pope uh, <coughs> Francis wrote this encyclical on the environment in Italian, not in Latin. And in a very folksy kind of style, he quotes St. Francis a lot. And, uh, it's designed to get your interest. 
And uh, so I think we're seeing a much needed change in user-friendly documents coming out from Rome. And I think this vocation of the business leader is uh, a wonderful example of that. So a good work, again, is uh, organizing good and productive work that helps people develop uh, uh, as persons. And uh, good wealth is using resources to create and share wealth. It's interesting. Uh, they go on and say, point out that wealth isn't just money. We tend to want to put a dollar figure on everything. And uh, that's never been Catholic social teaching. But this document says it in a way that many more can hear what the church has been saying. And that I means wealth is our physical, our psychological uh, environments that we're in, and business should help create good wealth, uh, a, a good environment in which you and I uh, and all those can develop, especially uh, those who have little, uh, the poor. Uh, and so, uh, in many ways, the Catholic social taught in, in VBL is vocation of the business leader, that's the document I'm referring to, is very, very similar to leading secular thought on what the purpose of, of business is. And uh, I think uh, it's come a long way. Uh, and I have found in giving seminars to business leaders, I talked about six or seven Notre Dame clubs a year uh, about this document. And I, I found uh, that it is a document that uh, people can hear. Uh, it does reach them uh, in its language that, um, that is user friendly. And so I encourage you to, if you're uh, uh, interested in these issues, to, to uh, Google that document and, and take a look at it. Um, and then uh, Good Wealth says we should have just wages for employees, just prices for customers, just returns for investors, uh, just prices for suppliers, and in fact, uh, just taxes, and we should pay them. <laughs> and uh, I mean, those of you who study Greece uh, at the moment, half the people don't pay taxes. I mean, it's just incredible in, in, in America. There are probably some who don't pay taxes. There are, you know that. But if you get caught, you go to jail. <laughs> but it doesn't happen in a lot of parts of the world, unfortunately. And uh, I remember a friend of mine <clears throat> who was running a big operation for a multinational in Italy. And uh, they told him he had to keep two sets of books, which is routine in Italy. And you know, one is for the government, the other is for the real set. He said, well, I, I'm a devout Catholic. I couldn't do that. We got it. And they said, well, you're going to pay much more taxes than you should pay. And uh, well, he, I'm not sure how he worked it out, but uh, <laughs> uh, we'll let that one think about. Uh, then I wanted to give you some thoughts on the UN Global Compact uh, because uh, my experience teaching here at Notre Dame for over 25 years, and uh, as some of you may know, I started out with Professor John Houck, whom I know some of you here had in class because they, you've talked to me about it already. Uh, and uh, one of the things that we uh, decided early on is Obviously, when you go into the office, you can't be wearing your faith on your sleeve. Uh, you want to bring the spiritual values of Catholic social teaching, the dignity of the person, for example, and the way you, but you can't be talking uh, doctrine. Uh, and one of the ways that we found was very helpful is to work through uh, the UN Declaration of Human Rights, which is essentially uh, what it means to be uh, honoring the dignity of the human person. And you can get a large coalition of business leaders excited about that who may not be Catholic, may not even be religious. Uh, and uh, so um, that in, in brief, and, and we'll have plenty of time for questions, and some of you may want to pursue uh, some of these uh, issues. But what is the UN Global Compact? Just a couple of words. <clears throat> in 1999, Kofi Annan, who was Secretary General of the uh, United Nations gave a talk to the World Economic Forum, and he basically said, if we want to have uh, world trade, and if we want to continue creating the massive amounts of wealth that globalization has enhanced, then we're going to have to find a way to distribute it better. 
because although a lot of people have profited immensely from uh, globalization, some people have not, have gotten poorer. And so there has to be a way uh, to have a set of ideals and principles that big companies, particularly around the world, would agree to follow. Uh, and uh, otherwise, this globalization is going to find uh, themselves uh, heavily criticized and, and maybe uh, uh, suspended from uh, some uh, parts of the world. And he made a very persuasive case. Well, some businesses came to him after and said, we think this is a good idea, a set of principles, a set of ideals that companies would voluntarily follow, uh, basically concerning human rights, uh, particularly in developing countries. And the kind of background uh, for this speech in 1999 was, uh, probably you, you all remember the Nike case. Uh, Nike is, manufactures a lot of the sports apparel that you and I wear, and, uh, and they give free samples to colleges and universities. And Nike was criticized for manufacturing in sweatshops. I mean, 80 hours a week, not paying people a salary that could even feed their families, uh, sexual harassment, the whole gamut of... N Nike's original response was, we don't own any of those subcontractors. We're only a marketing company, which is correct. A lot of people don't know that. that mar Nike is marketing. And we design all that, but we don't own any of those subcontractors. And there are thousands of them. Do you think we have a moral responsibility to monitor the behavior of our subcontractors? And their answer was no. Now, people like me said, yes, we do. <laughs> but I can remember those discussions in the 80s and 90s. And Nike was absolutely persuaded that they did not have a moral responsibility to monitor the behavior of their subcontractors. Well, to make a long story short, they suffered some boycotts and a lot of bad press. And finally, their board said, yeah, we, we do. <laughs> We're going to be the best employer uh, in, our, in this area. And they hired a group of monitors who go around and review uh, their subcontractors. And if you don't measure up in treating your employees decently, you don't get a new contract from Nike. And Nike is uh, quite, uh, I have not done original research. Some of my colleagues have. Nike is one of the best employers in developing countries. But it was this kind of problem that Kofi Annan was worried about uh, in the world today, that a lot of the poor were being abused. And uh, the other story was, of course, uh, one that I hear often from Regis Philbin. Regis Philbin's Kathy Lee Gifford, remember, remember those two? Uh, and uh, I found it hard to take myself, but my sisters love it. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, Kathy Lee Gifford had a line of clothing with her name on it, which was sold, and she kept getting these reports about that stuff is, is put together in sweatshops in very poor countries. And she was assured by the company that it wasn't true, and finally she hired her own investigators, and they came back and said, it's worse than they're even saying. And that's when she got into this movement and was very effective in, in trying to stop it. At least her clothing is not made in those kind of situations anymore. But anyway, that's the background for the UN Global Compact, uh, trying to say we ought to have a, a voluntary code that big companies would follow, and uh, basically advancing human rights in developing countries. Uh, I got in it. Uh, they asked me to, to help, uh, and uh, I've been involved as a member. There's a three-person board of directors that oversees the finances and broad policy. We have a 1,000 CEOs coming to the United Nations today from all over the world. And, and uh, we're going to meet in the General Assembly uh, and, uh, and talk about some of these issues, how we're doing after 15 years, where we have to go, and uh, what are the problems, and, and uh, what, what might be uh, the solutions. And Kofi Annan, when he first, we first uh, talked to him uh, about this, he said, I, you know, I think having it housed in the UN would be a good idea, but I'm not sure I can get it through the General Assembly. Uh, and uh, because a lot of countries are somewhat unfriendly to big business uh, because they saw them as the problem, not the solution. 
uh, Kofi Annan said, I think we should do it. So he went before the General Assembly and he said the famous speech, if the United Nations is to be relevant in the 21st century, you better get business involved, and especially big business, because that's where the power is. It's not in nation states anymore. And that, that, of course, is true, those of us who research it. I mean, there's certainly going to always be power in nation states, but uh, the kind of power that big business has is just mind-boggling. I mean, do you know that General Electric has an annual budget greater than 95% of the nation states of the world? They don't like me to keep saying that. <laughs> but where there's money, there's power, let me assure you, as one who studies these issues. Uh, so I think Kofi Annan uh, had it right. He got it through the General Assembly. Uh, and we've done a lot of wonderful projects uh, through the uh, Global Compact. Um, I, I could talk, there's several thousand of them, uh, but I'll just give you one that I was involved in. Uh, the pharmaceutical industry 15 years ago was heavily criticized because about six or seven of them had medicines which could contain HIV AIDS. There's no cure, as you know. But there are medicines today that can, you can take, and if you follow the regimen, you can lead a normal life. And I'm, I'm sure we all have friends who are taking them. Uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, 25 million people had HIV, and none of them were taking medicines because they had no money. Uh, and there was a criticism that the company should be doing something. There are six or seven who have these medicines. And the company said, okay, we agree. We can't do everything because if we give medicines for free for 20 million people for the rest of their lives, we're all bankrupt. <laughs> you know, it's just not possible. But we can do something. And just to give you an example, Merck said, we'll adopt one country and we'll uh, give them free medicines and $50 million for the first five years to set up uh, an infrastructure for it. So they adopted Botswana, where 30% of the people had HIV, just to give you an idea. And Botswana is just north of South Africa, where I've been spending two months out of the year for the last 20 years, just incidentally. Um, and uh, so, uh, Merck went in and they did a detailed study and said, even with our 50 million, we still can't develop the infrastructure that's required because you need to build clinics in the rural areas because that's where most of this problem is. So they got the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to give 50 million for the first five years. And together with the government of Botswana, who agreed to educate the people, they would take that piece of the pie. And Merck would supply medicines and, and uh, educating the doctors and nurses. And, and the, the Gates Foundation would take care of the, building the clinics. And uh, that was 10 years ago. And so it's in its second five years. There's 100,000 people on antiretrovirals who would be dead by now if they didn't take it. Who are, and, and, the, and the good news is the rate of transmission is way, way down. The young people are not getting it anymore because they're being educated. You know, you don't have to get AIDS. <laughs> you, know, you can change your behavior. And that's what the the uh, government has worked on very effectively. So it's, it's a good story of how uh, a company used its power. And um, it's interesting, when Bill and Melinda Gates actually came over and looked at this project when we talked about it with them, and Bill said, I'll, I know you're going to ask me to renew this for a second five years, because that was in the overall structure of the paper. But I will not renew it unless you can show me you've passed on the management skills to the local people. You're going to bring all these experts in from Harvard Medical School and all that. But he said, I want to see that you pass the management skills on to the people of Botswana, because that's where poverty is not lack of money. He said, I could throw money in there. Poverty is lack of management skills. And I thought Bill was right on. That's exactly my experience. It's not lack of money. It's lack of management skills. And that's what they have picked up. They, they spent a lot of time educating the people. Uh, about how to administer this program and, and, in fact, how to take better care of their health. Um, so it's a great case study, and there, as I say, there are <laughs> two or 3,000 of them. But that just gives you, a, just to put our toe in the water to give an idea of the kind of thing we're asking uh, uh, companies uh, to do. Now, and uh, I'm covering a lot of ground, but we have plenty of time for questions. When we get in this document, again, this is the vocation of the business leader. 
the implicit structure of this document is making a distinction between looking at work as a job, looking at work as a career, and looking at work as a vocation. And as I listened to the Archbishop last night, I thought this is very similar, his discussion of, of Pope Francis uh, uh, resonates very much with the notion of vocation. Let's just look briefly at each one. Uh, a job. You know, uh, a lot of our students have jobs uh, flipping burgers in the summer to make money. They need money for education or for a trip or whatever they want to do. So the motivation of a job is extrinsic, usually to make money. And we've all had a job. And some of us probably even today do certain jobs uh, for extrinsic motivation. There's certain things I have to do to keep my tenure, even though I don't get much reward out of it personally. Uh, so there are certain jobs. But uh, a career is intrinsic motivation. A career is uh, my accountancy students master the discipline of accountancy, and they are able to do financial reporting and uh, accountability checks. And they feel very fulfilled when they've mastered this discipline and can do it well. Intrinsic motivation. And so a career is, is important. We would hope all of our students develop some special skills and master some discipline so that they can feel good about what they do in the end of the day. But a vocation is distinguished from both a job and a career. A vocation is having some overarching worldview. Uh, and we quoted the uh, document of the lay apostolate opening up the discussion. The overarching worldview there is the kingdom of God is advanced by what you do by what I do. I remember talking to a guy in the soft drink business. He said, I'm just pushing soft drinks. How do I have a location? So I said, you do. Let me show. Let me show you how what you do is uh, part of advancing the kingdom of God. And so a vocation is some overarching worldview uh, that provides meaning. And so it's certainly intrinsic motivation, but it's more than a career. And one of the points this document makes is when you look at what is the role of leisure in each one of these? And in, in a job, if you're flipping burgers all day, you need to do something to unwind. So the role of leisure is amusement. And you may play on the computer. You may go out drinking with friends. And that's what most of my students do, I think. Uh, and, uh, but leisure is amusement. In a career, leisure is time out for rest. So I can be a better accountant. I better get a good night's sleep. And uh, I better take a little vacation because I'm getting stressed out. So leisure is rest. In a vocation, leisure is contemplation. In other words, the role of leisure, very similar to our discussion last night, the role of leisure is to help us keep in play this overarching worldview, in the case of Catholic social teaching, advancing the kingdom of God. So leisure is contemplation, it's prayer, it's, it's uh, the sacraments, uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's time out, but it's more uh, than rest. I, I quote in the paper, and, and the, the paper is available, anybody uh, wants it, just see uh, Tom, uh, Mike rather. Uh, there's a very interesting quote that I use here, um, and they make the point many times, about the role of leisure in vocation. He's talking about sacramental worship. He says, sacramental worship is not an escape from the world of business. It gives us the space to see more deeply into the reality of the world and to contemplate God's work. So, in other words, the role of leisure for a vocation is to help us see, uh, what is my overarching worldview? Why do I get up in the morning? What is it that's uh, energizing me? And if you have this vision that you're advancing the kingdom of God through what you do each day, whether it's managing a family or managing a business or, or creating a, you know, soft drinks or, or what, uh, the sacramental uh, worship is not an escape from the world of business. It gives us a space to see more deeply into the reality of the world and to contemplate 
God's work. And I think that's, uh, that's crucial uh, in, in the document. And I think that's one of the points that uh, underlies uh, Pope Francis' whole vision of how we want to transform uh, the church. Um, in my work in the UN, I meet a lot of influential people. As I say, I'm going, there's a, a, a close to a thousand CEOs coming in town right now in, in New York City. I remember the CEO of a major firm, a huge firm, <clears throat> uh, one of our last meetings grabbed me and he said, you know, <clears throat> I'm a Catholic, I'm a conservative Catholic, and I'm having a very hard time understanding what Pope Francis is doing. Uh, and he said, I don't, I don't see it. Uh, and this guy was obviously no dummy. I said, well, let's sit down and talk about it. And uh, I said, you know, we've all seen companies that kind of went astray from their mission. And I think what Pope Francis is trying to do is to bring us back on our mission. Uh, we've all seen companies that were getting known for what they were against rather than what they were for. And I said, when they go out and hire a guy like you, and he, he turned a huge company around, they're trying to get someone to restore the core values and mission of the organization, because that energizes the employees. Uh, and I said, don't you think Pope Francis is trying to get back to core gospel values, trying to focus on the mission, trying to help us to be known for what we're for rather than what we're against? He's not trying to change what we're against. He's just trying to give us a different focus. Well, this gentleman said, I'm going to think about this. He wrote me a long letter after and said, this has been tremendous. He said, now I understand what's going on. Uh, and I think, uh, that's, uh, I think that's true in all the documents coming out uh, under his um, leadership uh, in the church. And at least in my view, uh, <laughs> it's the answer to prayers. <laughs> <laughs> Um, some of the key points that are made in this document, vocation of the business leader, he uses the um, uh, Cardinal Cardin, the three stages of seeing, judging, and acting. And those of you who've been around a long time know that this is uh, uh, not a new idea, uh, but they, they uh, use it a lot in, in Europe, and, and, and this document focuses on it that there are three things that the business leader ought to do. Uh, and uh, the first is seeing what's really going on. And he says there are three things, four things we should look at, which are in many ways very good, but have a downside. And the business leader would want to try to make sure they advance the good points of globalization, for, for example. And, and try to mute the weak, the weak points of globalization. Globalization, obviously, has created massive, massive amounts of wealth. <clears throat> if you, for example, if you look at India or China, in China, in the last 20 years, 300 million people have been pulled out of dire poverty. Most Americans don't know that. 300 million people have been pulled out of dire po poverty in China. And uh, never in the history of the world has anything like this happened so quickly. That's a result of globalization. Now, some people would say it's because you people are buying all that Apple stuff that's made in China, but, uh, and there's something there. But the fact is, they have created jobs. They have created uh, wealth in China. And to some extent, that's true in India. The downside is, in Africa, many people got it poorer for a whole lots of reasons. So it hasn't been uniformly. And, and in fact, in Africa, sometimes human rights are more violated today than they were uh, before globalization. So it needs a, a fresh look, and that's what we try to do in the UN Global Compact, and, and vocation of the business leader uh, focuses on that. The same with communications technology. It certainly has a lot of value. Uh, you and I can talk on email and what have you and uh, get a lot of things done a lot quicker, organizing our life, but it also uh, it has some downsides, and it can be dehumanizing in some cases, and the doc document goes into that. Financialization, <clears throat> meaning you can put a price tag on everything. And uh, in fact, some things that are very valuable in my life and your people's lives, you can't put a price tag on. 
and we have to keep reminding ourselves that. Uh, broader cultural changes, it talks at some length in the fact that we're very dedicated in this country to uh, the human rights of the individual, individual rights. We do forget about the community and the common good. <clears throat> and this is where the church is trying to assert itself and saying, hey, while individual rights are important, let's not forget about communal rights, the common good, uh, and, uh, and the role of government in society as well as business. <clears throat> the second step, and again, seeing, it points out, as I already, uh, that to see really, you have to participate in contemplation. You have to participate in the common life of prayer, the common life of the church, uh, so that you can have a vision where you see the hand of God in daily life. Uh, and so it isn't just going to happen for most people. You need to have the role of the church, the role of contemplation in the lives of our business leaders. <clears throat> Judging the second step, the core principles are respect for human dignity, business as a community, and power as service for the common good. Uh, and I think uh, uh, those are pretty clear and, and not new principles for Catholic social teaching. In acting, um, again, it talks about a problem which many of us have experienced. Uh, uh, so many uh, dedicated Catholics check their religious values at the office door. <laughs> I mean, uh, I remember a Fortune magazine called me up and said, how do you explain Ken Lay, who was the CEO of Enron? He was a very devout elder in his church in Houston. And he used to, every morning, go in and lead a prayer group before he went to work. And <clears throat> Fortune had honored him with, before the Enron case broke being a, one of the top business leaders in the United States. And they were extremely embarrassed when it turned out it was a whole house of cards. Uh, and it, it was a complete uh, fraud, <coughs> the accounting system in Enron. And they called me up and said, well, how do you explain the fact that he was so devout religiously, and yet he went in the office and systematically stole his secretary's pension? Uh, which is the way they put it. I'd never forgotten that <clears throat> because she lost everything. And, they, and I said, I don't know. You don't explain it. It's irrational. That's what the, they were trying to tell us in Genesis, <laughs> Adam and Eve. You know, it was, it's sin. It's evil. It's a blind spot. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure that uh, you can explain it. But people do have a great ability uh, to get involved in massive denial, you know, and uh, a psychiatrist friend of mine who's one of our priests, I talked to him about this a lot, and he said, look, uh, all of us have a denial mechanism for our sanity, <laughs> and there are some things that you can push away you don't want to think about, uh, but when denial is very, very harmful to the common good, then usually your spouse stops you or your good friends say, hey, wait a minute, you thought about this or that, and uh, so... Uh, unfortunately, Ken Lay didn't have anybody that told him. Or he, and so he was in massive denial. I mean, I don't think he really saw all the harm he was doing. Uh, and that's, the document goes into that uh, and says you can overcome that by an act of spiritual life through prayer and contemplation. Uh, in other words, getting back to the other point, that the role of contemplation in vocation, which they keep coming back to in the document. So they're very much stressing the sacramental life, the life of prayer, uh, and trying to keep alive a worldview uh, that enables you to see God's hidden face even in uh, the deals of, of commerce. One of the, uh, I think, brilliant things of this document is it doesn't give answers. It poses the questions and says, look, a lot of these business leaders are more intelligent than we are. <laughs> and, but here is the questions that Catholic social teaching would raise, and you answer them uh, in your own individual life. And it gives a, a, a checklist. It's called a discernment checklist for the business leader. And I'm not going to read them all, but I'll just pick out. Uh, do I see work as a gift from God? 
Have I been living a divided life, separating gospel principles from my work? Am I seeking to nourish my business life by learning more about the church's social teaching? Am I engaging in anti-competitive practices? <clears throat> Is my company making every reasonable effort to take responsibility for externalities and unintended consequences of, ex of its activities? such as environmental damage or other negative effects on suppliers, local communities. Are jobs and responsibilities in my company designed to draw upon the full talents and skills of those doing the jobs? Have these responsibilities and their scope been clearly defined? Do I place the dignity of all workers above profit margins? As a business leader, am I seeking to deliver fair returns to providers of capital, fair wages to employees, fair prices to customers and suppliers, and fair taxes to local communities? And it goes on. There's several pages of these. but uh, I find it very helpful because uh, so often uh, when we do work with business leaders, we want to come in and tell them what they should do. This is a different approach, uh, a very much Pope Francis approach, saying, oh, here are the questions. You tell me how you're handling this. Here are, here are the Christian principles and the questions that evolve out of those principles. Uh, one final point, and, and that's a, a little bit on the ministry of preaching uh, and how you might bring this uh, into uh, preaching. Uh, and this is what, of course, I try to do with my students. I say mass. I live in a student dormitory, only in residence. I don't have any responsibilities other than saying mass. And, and most of them come, believe it or not, uh, on Sundays. Uh, but the notion of vocation, I see, just say by way of passing, there's a broader meaning of vocation. It's God's call for people to come to Christ and participate in redemptive work in the world. Uh, but I'm, I'm actually interested in the more specific meaning of vocation, uh, God's guidance to a person to do a particular kind of work based on the needs of the world and the unique gifts one has. And so, I mean, I try to tell all the students that you've got a unique vocation and you've got to discern what it is by, first of all, looking at your gifts. I mean, you, want to, you may want to be a great football player, but you, you know, can't throw the ball. Uh, and you, it's not one of your gifts. Uh, so look at your gifts and your strengths. Look at your passion. What are you very interested in? What gives you a uh, good feeling when you do it? And, uh, and what are the unique challenges that might be uh, in your environment that you could meet? Uh, so, and, and again, that follows from reflection on Genesis, where we're told that we're co-creators with God, trying to advance uh, the kingdom of God. Uh, and make a better life for all. The key biblical text for vocation is uh, Luke 12, 48. And this, in fact, is the gospel for the 19th Sunday in order, Ordinary Time, uh, year C. Uh, and it's uh, from everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much will be asked. And that's a crucial text. And in fact, in paragraph one of this document, uh, that's the opening text. <laughs> it's the overarching text for the whole document. Uh, Luke 12, 48, from, from everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from, from the one who has been entrusted with much, much will be asked. And working with a lot of business leaders, what is so clear is these people are very bright. You know, people say, oh, they got there by cheating or this or that. Uh, look. The great majority got there because they're extremely talented. They have really uh, been given uh, lots of gifts. And that's the next point, the logic of gift. And this is something that uh, uh, said very well in, in uh, the uh, document by Pope Benedict, uh, uh, Caritas uh, in Veritate. He, he focused on this logic of gift. And he said, you know, you ought to help people understand 
that one of the reasons they are charged to make the world a better place is they were given immense talents. And those who were given those talents uh, ought to return them uh, by what they do in their life. And that's certainly uh, what we try to stress uh, here at Notre Dame, that uh, frankly, they wouldn't be here if they weren't immensely talented. Uh, and uh, okay, that's great. And we're gonna even hone those talents even more. But don't forget about the logic of gift, that is, if you've been given much, you must return much. Uh, and I think Pope Benedict uh, said that extremely uh, effectively. Uh, again, I always, uh, you can either look at the world and saying the glass is either half full or half empty. There are lots of reasons you could be very negative and pessimistic. And I suspect uh, from the way I was nursed by my mother, I'm very positive <laughs> the glass is half full. I think we've made immense progress uh, in making the world a better place. And I think uh, through uh, business leadership as a vocation and working with the UN Global Compact, we have the prospect of making it an even better place. Thank you. Questions, comments? Yes, uh, he's absolutely true. Most jobs are created by small and medium-sized businesses. In the UN Global Compact, of the 8,000 companies, 50% are small and medium-sized. Uh, so we're definitely not forgetting that dimension. On the other hand, uh, it's good to remember a lot of small and medium-sized businesses get their business from multinationals. So it's very much interrelated. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, a lot is the answer, but let me just tell you, I said the UN Global Compact is basically trying to advance human rights, but the subdivisions, there are 10 principles. The first two are concerned explicitly with human rights of individuals. Then there is a section on labor rights. Then there's a section on environmental issues and rights. And the final section is on anti-corruption issues. They're all concerned with human rights, but we've spent some time on these other issues, environment, labor, corruption, because we think they're very, very important. So the environment is, is a crucial issue. And I think Pope Francis in his latest encyclical has helped us see that it's not just a technical problem, it's a moral issue. It's a moral issue, uh, the, the degradation of the environment, because it's gonna harm people, especially the poor. It already is in some places. So I think there's a great attempt to try to preserve the rainforests and have companies uh, get on the right side of that issue. And uh, the, uh, the, the coffee issue, you know, one of uh, my heroes is Howard Schultz who founded Starbucks. And uh, Howard Schultz uh, is spoken here, and the students love him, he's also a charmer, uh, and extremely talented. And say. And that's my experience with so many of these guys. People say, oh, they were just lucky. They're also lucky and brilliant. <laughs> uh, but uh, I mean, Howard Schultz has got you and I to go in and pay $3 for a cup of coffee. Can you imagine that? Uh, uh, but anyway, uh, he put a lot of time into going down and say, where are these coffee beans coming from? And these people who are picking the coffee beans, what are they getting? Well, they were getting hardly anything. And they, and so he said, I'm only buying coffee 
from plantations where they pay a, living, a fair wage, a living wage. And, uh, and people said, Howard, that means your stock price is, you're taking money from your shareholders. And he said, let me sell my stock, because that's what I'm going to do. Uh, and I mean, he's a real model of uh, the kind of business leader that I hold up as possible. Returning wealth for investors, but creating sustainable value for stakeholders. Employees of Starbucks, they have good sustainable value created for them. Suppliers, those people picking the coffee beans uh, and the whole gamut, the communities where Starbucks is present. So it is possible to do all these things and still retain investor confidence. I think it's very easy to be cynical about business, the business people and business practices. And I think a lot of that comes from the fact uh, or the practice of a failure to listen, really, to people. And this speaks to preaching, too. We could do a better job of listening to the people with whom we preach. But uh, so I think we, we really need, and you're suggesting this is happening on certain levels, but even more on a local level, to really listen to business people, to hear what their concerns are as um, religious slash business people, or people, business people who are faithful and religious. Uh, and then secondly, I think, this is my opinion, that I don't think the church does a very good job of preparing them to be ethical people in their various uh, business settings. Uh, and I think the p place to begin to prepare them is to listen to them first to see what their real needs and concerns are and where they bump up against some real conflicts. And they're going to have conflicts the same way that we have conflicts in the way that we practice our own kinds of ministries. So. I'm not cynical about business uh, because it helped put me through college <laughs> and seminary and graduate school. Yeah. Uh, but uh, there are, it's easy to get, as I say, to get cynical, but there's a lot more going on. Our, our uh, way of life is um, overall improved. But for me, the beginning place to work towards what you're proposing is just to sit down and listen yeah. to what they have to say and what their concerns are. Right on. I think that's correct. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think for the recording of this, I'd like you to speak in yeah. the mic. Uh, I'm Dan Levy from the University of Dallas. Um, one of the challenges for me in a, listening to a presentation like this, which is encouraging and illuminating, is that it, I, I sort of tend to think of it in terms of titans of business, I mean, convincing people who are board members of great big companies or who are CEOs or executive vice presidents. But I'm, I'm thinking that for most preachers, most Sundays, most of the people they're preaching to are workaday, you know, folks, whether they work for a big company or a small one, they're not policymakers. They're not <clears throat> in a position to say, we should buy all our coffee from a fair, fair trade supplier. So how do you kind of bridge that gap between, I, I find a lot of the Vatican documents, even going back to the council, speak as if the people we're talking to are these high rollers, and I think the ordinary people are kind of still left trying to figure out, well, if my company doesn't want to do this or behave this way, wh where does that leave me? Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, and uh, I, I think you say a, a, a very good account that a good number of our important businesses are small and medium size, and they would be the people often that we're talking to. Uh, not so true here at Notre Dame uh, for the people that I educate, but uh, I think there are a lot of examples of small and medium sized businesses who are in fact seeing the purpose of business as creating sustainable value for stakeholders, who do look after their employees and their customers who look after their investors and their communities. And maybe getting some local stories uh, is what I would do. And uh, when I visit my sister, I preach usually in the church, but I always garner some local stories to help them because that's uh, talk about these issues. And that's what I would suggest. I'm Father Matthew Malik. And I have been ordained as a priest and, uh, for about two years, and I've been with the Franciscans, though, for about 10. And before coming into religious life, I worked in workforce development. I was part of what 
a nonprofit that was through the Work One system that exists here in Indiana. And part of what I'm struck by in, the, in your paradigm, which I find very helpful, is that we really are changing, at least maybe, and this may be a very North American reality, of what career means. That in reality, there are people who have often, like my brother, who have the good fortune to get a bachelor's in chemistry from Georgia Tech and has worked for the same basic company ever since 1979. But he's a novelty. That any more, really, that concept of a career where I will pick a job or a type of field to work in is really changing. That we are now in reality preparing young people and trying to re-prepare a workforce that thought they were done, you know, that they had gotten their training, that everything would, they're working towards retirement, that in reality it will be three to five different careers, not employers, but that in re we have to retool. So I'm kind of wondering that part of our biblical message should in a way be gird your loins, because we will be more and more, and are, a people in flight, in essence, in a constant state of change. And I wondered if what your reaction to that might be, that in this, some of this I think roots to globalization, some of it to people oftentimes wanting to increase the bottom line, and a whole lot of factors, but I know I'm preaching to a number of people who thought in their 20s and 30s they would have a stable life in terms of their employment, and they are now in their 40s, 50s, 60s, they don't. And they're confronted with a world that has changed very, very rapidly. Yeah, I think you point to a, a phenomenon that's, uh, quite relevant all over the world, and that uh, you can't count on one job for a whole lifetime, as maybe our parents could have. Uh, and I think our students are very aware of that. Now, one of the things that I teach is that employers should create sustainable value for their employees, and that means helping them keep up in their field. And so they're mobile if, if something happens. You know, because we have globalized, Companies do go up and down uh, in the number of employees they're able to, to manage and what have you. But what the company can do is to see that you're in good shape if you need to look for another job. And the best companies do that. They have opportunities for more education uh, while they're working. And uh, uh, we do executive MBA programs here. And you see a lot of middle-aged people coming back uh, to get retooled, and they're being paid for by their company. And I think that's one of the things that I look, would call creating sustainable value for employees. Yeah. I don't think we can change the world, as you point out, but we can adopt, adapt. I'm Susan McGurgan, and I'm the director of the Lay Ministry Program for the Archdiocese of Cincinnati. Most of our students are non-traditional age. They're in their 30s, 40s, 50s. Many men and women who are business executives or have long-time careers in marketing and, and that. And I was not familiar with this document, so first of all, thank you for introducing it to us. Um, and, and I see this as, as being something valuable to introduce to our students along with called and gifted and, and all of the other documents on lay ecclesial ministry and lay formation and the lay vocation because I think so often, especially the people that I talk to, feel that they kind of have to change their lives. You know, they have this call from God to do something different with the second part of their lives, and somehow they have to, to change everything, and they have to go into ministry, um, work for the church, and I think this could be very inspiring for them. Have you used this in lay formation here at Notre Dame? Yes. How has that gone? How do you introduce it, and how has that gone? Uh, I think it's it, it's gone well. I mean, we have. Uh, I often have people will come back and say, uh, "I'm retiring. I'm financially in good shape. But what what kinds of ways can I use my skills in helping the world be a better place?" Well, there are a lot of places where you you can help them volunteer to help small businesses starting up in poor communities, and uh, basic business skills that we might think everybody has, they don't, <laughs> and you can get, uh, you know, and retired people might find a lot of fulfillment out of that. Uh, so I, I would encourage you to look at those kinds of issues. Every community has places where you can use those people. And it's a shame, you know, somebody retires, they're financially in good shape, 
They don't have to get up every morning at 7 o'clock anymore, but they sure don't want to just do nothing, you know, because they're healthy. <laughs> and that's because we've got all uh, good medicines. <laughs> yeah. Hello, Father. I'm Peter Clifford. I'm pastor of a, a suburban parish just outside Rochester, New York. We've got a congregation full of CEOs and small business owners and retired owners and, and, the, and the like. Um, so I already downloaded the PDF. That's it's very easy to get to, as you, as you said. Uh, would this be? Uh, would you use this as a kind of a, a, a study tool, kind of a, a discussion tool, uh, and offer it out to, to to folks? And 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 secondly, or or additionally, would you have suge particular suggestions? Uh, this is what this is what business leaders tell us they're not getting in their parishes. That's right. Uh, is is there some you know you ought to try this you ought to try this you ought to try this, and then this may be pushing you too much, but um, would there be themes in our preaching that we ought to focus on, knowing full well that we're talking to the fellow that is the CEO of Paychex Corporation and talking to the fellow that formerly ran Bausch and Lomb Corporation and which is falling on bad times, but whatever, um, and, and it, 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 you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and as well as has been pointed out, several lots of small business owners will, right. you know, much more. I think you will find you could use this document. Uh, and again, it's free and it's on the web. Uh, and you can even print it with all its pretty colored pictures. Uh, and uh, I've had good luck with it in, as a discussion piece. And then uh, some parishes, and frankly not enough, as a, after they go through this, and they say, well, how many here would like to join a little discussion group where we come and say some prayers? And you talk about the thing that's really bothering you in your business, and we follow the Chatham House rules. Nobody can quote you, you know, and get you in trouble. <laughs> uh, and uh, that's what I'd like to see. I think that's what people are asking for. And uh, I noticed your great discretion. You didn't mention Kodak which is in Rochester, used in business schools all over the country for a company that missed the boat. <laughs> they missed digital, digital and uh, they were still trying to get you to develop film. But that's another case. <laughs> Nothing to do with this. They were actually invented the first computer. Yeah. They missed that, too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, for all the, uh, the success stories that I talk about, there are some people, very bright people, who made some terrible errors in judgment and hurt a lot of poor people, which I'm sure you know in Rochester. Uh. Hi, uh, just kind of an observation. I'm John Kruger from Houston, and uh, I serve as a musician. And one of my weird little gigs that I've been doing for the last oh, seven or eight years has been directing a choir of VP employees. Ah, yes. Uh, and, you know, seeing these people just take a horrible and maybe deserved public relations beating over the, over the spill in the Gulf. Yes. And I'm directing a choir that I've got, you know, people that are cleaning that spill up. <laughs> yeah, in spite, yeah, in spite of the PR beating that they're taking, they're, you know, they're just kind of doing their thing, trying to do the right thing. But um, the other little observation is that you know, doing that choir has also put me in touch with, the, uh, with a couple of the Christian groups operating you know, within, you know, within BP out on the west side of Houston. They've got a very huge complex out yeah. there. Yeah. And to see these people you know, not only you know, counterbalancing you know, their belief system with vocation, uh, and, but trying to you know live it, and perhaps you know, show, you know, you know, bear witness you know, to living a baptismal life mm. through their vocation. It is, on one hand, uh, I know it's difficult. On the, on another, it's very fun to watch and to see that happening within the context of a company that sometimes has the reputation of just, yeah, um, generating income as opposed to doing anything else. Yeah. 
Well, uh, of course, my uh, philosophy is nobody's beyond redemption. <laughs> and, uh, and I've worked with some of the people from BP, and, and uh, you, you may remember Arthur Anderson. When, when, they went, when they folded, we had 500 Notre Dame graduates in Arthur Anderson. And most of them lost everything. You know, they had all their equity. And most of them had nothing to do with the Enron failure. It was very unfair. So we tried to reach out to them and, and help many of them find new positions. And, uh, so, uh, and, uh, so if, you know, if people want to try to do the right thing, they got me as a helper. <laughs> so I, I'm delighted you're working with the choir. <laughs> I don't think they can sing their way out of that problem, but they <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I, Houston has had some good leadership on this document. St. Thomas uh, College down there has had a couple of conferences that I spoke at, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and Cardinal Turks and, and a lot of business leaders from the extraction business were there. Yeah, I don't know whether they changed or not. But. Okay. Thank you very much.